Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. We worship you this day. Amen. You may be seated. How's everybody this morning? Good? We are here today to worship the Lord, to hear from God through our, the word, it's scripture, through singing, pouring out our praise. Um, so we're going to do that today. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house. I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak through me. Remove any words that are not from you, I pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable, O Lord, to you. Amen. Okay, so how many of you have ever had to make a decision in your life? Oh, come on. We've all had to make decisions in our lives. Some big, some small, right? Some momentous. What kind of toothpaste? Not so much. Um, we make decisions. All of us do. When we have to make these big decisions, how do you go about it? Some people write down lists, pros and cons. Some people just wing it, and there are those people in between. Rick and I had to make major decisions when God called me to go back to school to study to become an ordained minister in the Church of the Nazarene. At the time, my mother was living with us. My father had just passed, and I was working full-time, which left a big load on him, cooking, cleaning, taking care of my mom. Yes, my husband is a saint. Ladies, you should be so lucky. But big decisions, right? I had to, we had to give up stuff. I went to work, worked eight, ten hours a day, and then I came home and studied. He made dinner, I threw it down my throat, I studied till midnight every night. Those were decisions. Those was what it took to get to where God was calling me to be. The same thing when we thought God was calling us to move to Escondido. There were big decisions to make. Selling a house, buying a house. What about my job? What about, what about, what about, right? We've all had to make those decisions. What about you? What questions did you have before saying yes to a decision? What were the buts that might have kept you from saying yes? What Egypt did you long for or didn't want to give up? Did your yes depend on the majority opinion of others? Or did it depend upon trusting God enough to move forward with you? Have you been going around in circles recently wanting to say yes, but not quite there yet? Who is the Joshua or Caleb in your life? So many of you know this story that you know God sent Moses to rescue his people from slavery in Egypt. Moses knew the Pharaoh. He knew the lifestyle of the Egyptians. He went out into the desert and he heard God calling him. He had a huge decision to make. And he kind of said some buts, didn't he? But I don't talk so good, God. So God said, okay, I'll send Aaron with you. But God, and God said, well, okay, I'll give you a stick and I'll show who I am. But God, eventually Moses did go. And God performed many miracles that finally convinced Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. God promised that he would take them to a fertile place where they could thrive and be free to worship God. I'm going to be talking from the scriptures from Numbers chapter 13 and 14 today. Finally, Moses got the people out of Israel. They went across the desert. They got to the land. Right across the Jordan River was the promised land. Moses had some advisors, and they all thought, I'm sure they prayed about it. Moses had a good relationship with God and decided to send some scouts. So they sent one scout from each tribe. So there were 12 men. Two of them were Joshua and Caleb. I'll get that right in a minute. They said, I want a report. Go into the land. And this is what Moses said. 
Numbers 13, starting at verse 17. Moses gave the men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like. Find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls? Or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. The scouts did this. They went into the land. They looked around. And they came back. Just like Rick and I, we made two trips down here to look at houses. We went two days, five houses one day and four houses the next on the last trip. We looked online for months and months and months and discovered that nothing looks like it looks in the pictures online, right? But we looked, we searched, we did, we searched. Man, we went to El Cajon, we went to Chula Vista, we went to La Mesa, we went to Santee. Finally, we said, well, let's try Escondido. This is the report that the scouts brought back to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a beautiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. And they had brought back a big bunch of grapes that it took two people to carry. No, that's a big bunch of grapes. We even, they go, but the people there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev and the Hittites, Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. Well, I don't think that's really the answer that Moses was hoping they would bring, do you? What? I can't do this, sorry. Fortunately, Joshua and Caleb disagreed with the other 10. This is what they said. Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land. We can certainly conquer it. However, those other 10 scouts stirred up the crowd against Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb, flamed and wanted to have someone else put in charge. We want to return to Egypt, they cried. Numbers 14, verse 3. Then Moses and Aaron fell down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into the land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord. And don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Sadly, the people listened to the majority of the 10, right? They didn't seem to remember how God had rescued them out of slavery in Egypt. The God who had performed so many miracles so that Pharaoh would let them go. They didn't remember that God had kept them safe as they journeyed across the desert. Those 10 scouts only saw the giants, the impossible, and made the decision not to go, not to conquer the land God was giving them. They lobbied well among the people and created an atmosphere of distrust and fear. This did not please God at all. Numbers 14.10, but the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. Now listen to this, people. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. 
Now, I don't know, I've never had that visitation like that from God. I've been with God, but I haven't seen him, his presence standing in front of me in that way. Don't you think you would suddenly fall to your knees? I mean, amazing. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me even after all the miraculous signs I have done among them? I will destroy them and disown them, and destroy them with a plague. Then I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they are. Moses knew that God was not happy. He knew this was a disaster in the making. So he stepped in to plead for the Israelites. But Moses objected. What will the Egyptians think when they hear about it? He asked the Lord. They know full well the power you displayed in rescuing your people from Egypt. Now, if you destroy them, the Egyptians will send a report to the inhabitants of this land who have already heard that you live among your people. They know, Lord, that you have appeared to your people face to face and that your pillar of cloud hang, hovers over them. They know that you go before them in the pillar of a cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Now, if you slaughter all these people with a single blow, the nations that have heard of your fame will say, the Lord was not able to bring them into the land he swore to give them. So he killed them in the wilderness. Boy, I think Moses is being pretty bold, don't you? Please, Lord, prove that your power is as great as you have claimed. For you said... The Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every sin and rebellion. He does not excuse the guilty. He lays the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. But in keeping with your magnificent, unfailing love, please pardon the sins of these people just as you have forgiven them ever since they left Egypt. Then the Lord said, he heard Moses' prayer. He listened. He knew Moses' heart. I will pardon them as you have requested. But as surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people shall enter that land. God heard Moses, he spared the people, but as a consequence of their disobedience, they never got to end, enter into Canaan, the promised land. That is how they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They had a chance to make a decision, to step over in faith, and they chose not to. Yet for the faithful Joshua, and Caleb, the ones who said, but God, God made an exception. And because of their faithfulness and their willingness to be obedient, they and their descendants were saved and they were allowed into the promised land 40 years later. What does it have to do with us? We are all on a journey here. We're all on a journey in a place where God has promised us. In reality, we're on earth just a short time in the light of eternity, right? Just a short time. But we have decisions that we have to make along the way. But there are lessons that we can learn from reading this um, story in Numbers. Life happens. There are going to be uncertainties that we will have to face. That's for sure. Nothing, absolutely nothing, can happen that God cannot use. Nothing, even our disobedience. Sounds strange, doesn't it? But he can, he can use it. Because of God, there is no reason to be afraid of tomorrow. And in, is this what you are experiencing currently? Do you have God calling you into something and yet you're kind of weighing the pros and cons about making that decision. Our only hope into the promised land is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. 
Last week, Pastor Reed preached to us about he is the true bread. Jesus also called himself the vine. He says, abide in me and I abide in you and you will bear fruit. Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.20, all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. What God promised in the Old Testament, he promises us in the new covenant with Jesus. This is God's covenant with Joshua and is still for those of us who believe in Christ today and obey his commands. I took read John 3.16 out of the, passage, trans, the Passion Translation, and I just love it. Thank you for introducing that to me, Susan. Here's what John 3.16 and 17 says in that version. For here is the way God loved the world. He gave his only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to judge and to condemn the world, but to be its savior and rescue it. Our promise from God of forgiveness and rescue is in Jesus. I don't know if you remember in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 14, there was a story about a man who had a lot of wealth and he decided to give a great big feast and he invited a whole bunch of people. And finally, when the day came that everything was ready and prepared, he sent his servants out to let the people know, it's time, the feast is ready, come. And all he got back were excuses. One excuse was, I just bought some property and I got to go look at it. The second excuse was, I just purchased five team of oxen and I need to know if they'll pull the plow. Really? Another excuse was, I just got married and I can't leave my wife. We are being invited into the promised land. Revelation 22 says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone, anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. We don't even have to bring a gift to this party. It's all been done for us. Jesus invites us. For those of you who watch The Chosen and read your Bible, he always said, come, come, follow me, come. But what excuses do we make for not following where Christ is leading? I know I'm guilty of making excuses and putting things off. What about you? Does that mean that this life will be pain-free? No. All of us have suffered pain and loss in this life. Does it mean that nothing bad will ever happen? No, we live in a sinful world, a decaying world, of that world that God is longing to recreate into its beauty that he created in the beginning. But Jesus promised us that he will never leave us or forsake us. Never. Our participation in his kingdom does mean that there's some work for us to do. When the people got into the promised land, they had to conquer the land. It wasn't go over, sit in their easy chair and just eat those great big grapes. They had work to do. They had work to drive out the idol worship. They had work to do to drive out the things of evil that God was displeased with. Our participation in his kingdom means work, it means letting go of some things and moving forward. But God promises us an eternal reward of being in his presence forever. That's what we're working for. That's what our goal is, that's the promised land. But we can have be in the promised land now too because Jesus promised us in John 10, 10, I have come to give you everything in abundance, life in its fullness until you overflow. This promised abundance is God's love lavished on us, his peace in the midst of the storms, his compassion when we are hurting, his comfort when we are sick. These are all God's blessings, his joy, 
in the middle of disaster or bad news. He gives us blessings which are freely given to all of us. And he gives us the assurance of eternal life in his presence for all eternity. That's what our journey is striving for. Listen to what Joshua says again. God says to Joshua 40 years later. Now remember, it's 40 years later. Many of the people have died off. Joshua didn't stay the age he was. He was 40 years older. Caleb was 40 years older, his family. But God says to Joshua, Joshua 1, and I know that the Mosaic class has been studying Joshua. So you guys may have talked about this before if you've been in that class. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people. The Israelites lead them across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land that I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you as long as you live. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors that I would give them. And he repeats it, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually, continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I was looking up that word meditate because there was a period in life where meditation got a dirty name. Does anybody remember that? Was it transitional, whatever that was, T.I.? And meditate became something that wasn't so good because they were talking about meditating on the wrong things. This meditate, according to the books in the Greek, is to continually recite it all day long. They had no books to read. So the way people learned by it was by recitation, repeating over and over, kind of like we do with preschool, right, Susan? They can't read, so we repeat to them over and over. And that's what they had to do. So the parents repeated them to the children, and the children repeated them at school, and etc., cetera, et cetera. Meditate on them. Have them in your ears. Say them out loud so that it's easier to remember them. God said he would be with them. And Jesus told his disciples this again and again. I will never leave you. In Matthew 28, we read, the end of the great commandment, he goes, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. John 14, 5, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. The Holy Spirit is always with us. Jesus with us, always. In Hebrews 13, 5, don't love money, be satisfied with what you have. Isn't that one of our buts sometimes? But I don't know if I can live on that little bit of money. People believe me. I'm sure Joan and Terry can tell you, as a preacher's kid, you can live on very, very little because God makes it all abundant. I will never abandon you. I will never fail you, God says. The ten scouts said, but the land, the land is full of giants. It is not safe. We look like grasshoppers to them. Joshua and Caleb said, 
but God. Where do you need a but God in your life? This is why the New Testament continually challenges us. It challenges us to walk by faith, right? Kind of like you put blinders on a horse so it won't get spooked by the things on the side. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, so that we don't get distracted and sidetracked, but we are facing where we're going with Jesus. It says to trust in the Lord always, to not put our trust in the world. People live by a world view, and they're sad. You know, we hear some of the most rich people in the world, the money that everything could buy, and yet they're unhappy. And we know why, because they don't have the joy of the Lord in their soul, right? It says, do not trust what you see in your own humanity, but see where God is leading. And when you see the giants, say, but God. We move forward with God when we are obedient to his will, when we meditate on his word, when we spend time seeking his face in prayer and worship, both individually and corporately. Not only are we facing individual choices, transitions right now, we as a church body have voted to bring a new pastor. This is a new place to walk in faith. This is a new choice we are going to make to follow the pastor as he follows God, to pray for him. When we get tempted to say, we never did this before. People, I've heard this. I've been in a church since I was conceived. I've heard this. Or we've always done it this way. Think again. We think there are too many giants, but we can't, we can't, but, but. Remember, but God. So how do we do this? We keep on praying for our pastor, his family, and for each other. We need workers. We need more Sunday school teachers. Because I know God's going to send us more kids. Right, Susan? We need more helpers. We have people that clean the, the campus. If we get more people, we need more people to help do that. We need to pray for God to send us the workers. We need to pray for God to send us some seekers. People in this community that need God. Families that are struggling, that need God. We need to pray for our community. We should look to God's faithful, faithfulness and great love to be with us always. We are not alone. We are not doing this by ourselves. We are not Lewis and Clark setting off an adventure. We have a leader. We have one who wants the best for us, the best for our church, the best for this community. We keep our eyes on Jesus. We are to be strong and courageous. And I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it's being courageous is saying hello to somebody brand new that you've never seen in church before. But you never know if that smile and that say, glad you're here today, will do to, in the long run. Or maybe it's you need to be courageous and step out and take a task on that's needed to be done. There's always yard work to be done, huh, Ivan? Always yard work to be done. And I'm sure Ivan wouldn't mind having a couple more people sharing that joy with him. Some people love doing yard work. Why not? Why not use that gift of growing things for the church body? That is a gift that God gives people. And it blesses other people. God has great plans for his church here in Escondido. So as we move forward and things come up, and we want to go, uh, but uh, that's a giant, or uh, I don't think so, let's remember, but God, but God. God is the one who will give us the victory. God has promised that he would help those, the Israelites conquer the land. He would give them all the land they stepped their foot on. We here in Escondido, there's a lot of people that need Jesus, that are longing for a place of community, 
a safe place for their kids to come where they know they're loved and they're given the truth. God has great plans. I'm so excited. And I just pray that all of us together will take that step of faith. And remember when we get discouraged or when we think, oh, I don't know, we go, but God, and check out what God says. I'm going to read. I like reading the scriptures and making them prayers. I don't know. That's another way to pray. There's many ways to pray. But sometimes I don't have the words, all the words, but I can go, I can go to the Bible and I can find a passage of scripture that I can pray. And so someone's put a book together to help get me started. I'm reading it. And I just want to read this um, one that they, uh, if I can find it, from Joshua. Um, here it is. It's from Joshua. If you would stand with me and I will close. And if there's, a, if there's a giant in your life that you need to face and say, but God, you can come pray about it. The altars are always open. You have a praise. I have a praise this week. My sister-in-law, while we were on our cruise out in the middle of the ocean, had a major, major stroke at the end of February. This week, she drove down all the way from Sacramento. She, God, completely healed her. She should have been dead. She should have been crippled. She isn't, I mean, and it was just wonderful to see her, see how strong she is, how God has healed her. Um, that's a praise. If you have a praise, come down to the altar, or it's in your seat, or the first bench, whatever. I'll read this, and then I'll close in prayer. This is from Joshua 1, 7 and 9, a prayer. Lord, you have said, be strong and very courageous. So I ask for a strong and courageous heart. Help me to be careful to obey all the law that your servant Moses gave us. Give me the strength not to turn from it to the right or to the left so that I will be successful wherever I go. And Father, today I declare, I will not let this book of law depart from my mouth. I will meditate on it day and night. I will pray your law, the Bible, out loud to you every day. And as I pray your word, help me to be careful to do everything written in it. Then I will be prosperous and successful in everything I do. So as you have commanded me to be strong and courageous, I pray that I will be strong. I will not be terrified as I follow you. I will not be discouraged as I live out my faith. For you, O oh Lord, are with me wherever I go. Father God, you have brought us to another place in this journey of life, in this body of Christ in Escondido. We thank you for sending us another shepherd. We thank you for Pastor Rob and Laney as they come. We pray that you'll bless them, make their travels safe and smooth with no hiccups, no bumps in the road, no flat tires, no running out of gas, Lord. And as they journey here, may their hearts be filled with your all-consuming peace that they are following your will, that you have called them. And Lord, help us as we prepare for them. Lord, prepare our hearts, prepare our minds. Lord, help us to be willing to listen to our leader, to listen to you, to your Holy Spirit. Give our church a united spirit, Lord, with your Holy Spirit so that we can be the place in this community in Escondido that is welcoming our neighbors, welcoming all those who would come in, welcoming all the children that are gonna come and all the young adults that are gonna come, Lord, and to be receptive to changes. For Lord, we wanna be a place where people come to seek you and they find you, Lord, not because of anything of who we are or what we do, for all we do, we do as a gift to you through your power. But Lord, we want it to be all about you. The people will walk on this campus and feel such a loving spirit that they will want to know more about this Jesus that we sing about, that we praise, that we teach, that we love, Father God. I know there are many things to pray for today. We have people who are ill. There's lots of people not here today. We have people who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Lord, be with them and comfort them. 
Father God, there are so many people in the world and so many wars going on in the world. Lord, bring peace to your people. Help your people to be the peacekeepers in their villages and towns, Lord. Keep them safe. Keep your loved ones safe, Lord, your children all over the world. But Lord, we do just want to call on your name for this place today. For this first church of the Nazarene, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit. Pour out in abundance, Lord. Give the leaders your wisdom. Give the leaders your power and help the rest of us to step into the place where you are calling us, the place you're going to give us in Escondido, I pray, with faith and courage and boldness. We give you praise for we know with you all things are possible. All things are good. Giants may come, but God's got this. Evil may abound, but God knows. God is the winner in all of this, and we get to celebrate with him in his victories. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this time. Amen. Thank you. 